it's been about, what, almost 20 years since Stanley Cooper came out with this movie, Eyes Wide Shut. And probably for the last six years, I've been wanting to do a discussion on it. Because there's so much information that I found in it that no one else seems to uh, recognize at all. There's the thing to understand about Stanley Kubrick is that he's a, an artist that does everything in his movies absolutely intentionally. And they need to, people need to understand as well that uh, Stanley Kubrick is someone who understands uh, the tenets of Freemasonry um, extremely well and not um, just any Freemasonry. He's, he is from the Red Lodge. And that means that he has a grasp of the true meanings of the symbols of the, the craft. Albert Pike talked about the two levels of Freemasonry, the Blue Lodge and the Red Lodge. People of the Red Lodge truly understand the hidden meaning of the symbols of Freemasonry. But the Blue Lodge members, which is the majority, um, believe they understand, supposed to believe that they understand. But they do not. Another thing they need to understand about Stanley Kubrick is that he has an extraordinary grasp of uh, mythology and literature uh, in general. He also has a, a deep understanding of historical events and how they fit into the, the world scenario that the uh, Freemasons understand. And when you're watching his movies, if, if you don't take that into account, and take into account that Stanley has done everything in his movies to reflect his understanding of the true secrets, of the true meaning of the secrets of Freemasonry. You'll never really get to the point where you understand what's going on. A lot of people think they do, but that just isn't the case. For example, in this scene, the opening scene, eyes wide shut. You have a woman standing between our in a chamber that's framed by four pillars and the predominant color is red and it's well lit. This scene is simply a representation of the event in the Garden of Eden where Ben Nakash decides to pay Adam and Eve a visit and uh, convince Eve to take a bite of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. It's interesting here also that there's very prominently in the center of the screen that we place these two tennis rackets and at first I, I thought I'd just ignore that but of course through Kubrick fashion there's a very important meaning behind it. But before I explain the tennis rackets, what does being part of the Red Lodge mean? Why is the understanding of mythology important, and why is this understanding so valued by the Masonic fraternities? To answer these questions, one really needs to go back to the Garden of Eden, and uh, even before that, because the Garden of Eden doesn't make any sense to someone who doesn't believe in God. Incidentally, a prerequisite to becoming a Freemason is that the initiate must have a belief in God, or a higher power, as they say. An atheist could never comprehend Kubrick's art without a fundamental understanding of who God is, and by extension, his creation, the Garden of Eden, the evil bright angel that visited the garden of Adam and Eve. An atheist would perceive anything and everything I discuss in this video as nothing more than irrational foolishness. The Red Lodge knows that there's a God but believes that the shining angel of the garden is the one who gave mankind the light, knowledge, and life. Their belief is reversed 180 degrees from the Christian understanding. To them, it was Lucifer who freed men from the prison. That the spiteful and unjust God created at the time of the garden. They believe that the Nakash, which by the way, is Hebrew for the serpent slash angel, and that this Nakash has a redemptive plan for mankind, not the oppressor god. They also work towards facilitating or aiding Lucifer's plan to manifest as a god man on earth 
as their supreme and eternal ruler. Now I know that this is a lot of information to absorb just at the start of this video, but it is a crucial foundation to understanding the hidden meaning of Eyes Wide Shut. The Red Lodge understanding of mythology is that the characters, situations, and stories always point back to the aspects of the Shining Angel. Their god is Lucifer, and Lucifer perceives that he has undergone a great and unjust punishment from God. Um, I'll go back to the first scene now to kind of illustrate this. Here's Eve in the garden, just the moment that she has her eyes opened after eating the fruit. The account in Genesis says that her eyes were opened and she realized, her and Adam, after he ate the fruit as well, realized that they were naked. Of course, in this scene, everything's red and uh, it's framed by four pillars. You can perceive the pillars as what happened at the moment that Adam and Eve's eyes were opened. Paradise was lost, and death came to mankind. The whole scenario had changed. The pillars symbolize this separation, but there's light there, and there's a lot of red light. So from, from whose perspective do you think this is? In the next scene, we can see uh, William Hartford, played by Tom Cruise, in the same room as the woman, woman Alice Hartford, played by Nicole Kidman. See the pillars? Of course, the room's blue and red, which uh, gives you a clue as to where we are temporally in this movie. The aspects of the garden being played out it's interesting here, um, too, as uh, William's pausing to pick something up from the table, and there's this picture on the wall showing exactly what his name is. Well, the place where the heart would go across the river, or ford the river. Um, a heart is a stag that's worthy to be hunted and killed by royalty. Alice happens to mean noble-natured. So the, uh, the scene is a uh, set. Um, the characters are, have been identified here. Alice is Eve, and uh, Bill here is Lucifer. I think now is a good time to talk about a, a good illustration in mythology um, where the aspect of Lucifer is pretty clearly illustrated, and that's the example of Apollo going to the Ark of Delphi. Apollo. The shining one is Nakash, and he symbolically changes his image in preparation for his future expression in human form by coming as the slayer of his first manifestation, the serpent dragon Python, which Python means to rot. You can see the same story being played out in this mural that's painted the Security Council room within the United Nations. Here you have the underground rotting serpent who has a sword in its mouth. See, he, he slayed himself. Right, God didn't do it. The narcissistic Lucifer would never say that God did anything to him. He decided to do it to himself, right? Uh, but above him is this phoenix that's shed its old skin. And it's rising. And uh, if you don't really get what's going on below, just look above. You can see, you can see the little pan-like figure up here in the tree, distributing apples or or pyrocydonii to people. And all looks great. And there's this interesting Vesus Pisces here that the artist has put in the picture. And all these people are leaving this oppressed state, right? It's like they're coming out of prison or a prison camp and they're going to this happy place. And notice this area right here. All these little stars. Uh, you'll see this in the, one of the opening scenes. Or 
the party scene specifically that uh, Alice and Bill are preparing to go to here. And I haven't forgotten about the tennis rackets. Kubrick is uh, extremely clever and well-read. And uh, I looked around a little bit. Uh, it didn't make any sense to me what was going on with the tennis rackets. And then I found this painting by a guy named Gambiatista Tayipolo. And it's entitled The Death of Hyacinth. But it turns out Hyacinth was a beautiful youth and lover of the god Apollo. And I think Apollo taught him to use the bow and taught him music and prophecy and how to exercise in the gymnasium. Uh, one day Apollo and Hyacinth took turns throwing the discus and Hyacinth ran to catch it to impress Apollo, but was struck by the discus and died. Apollo did not allow Hades to claim the youth, but rather he made a flower known as the Hyacinth from his spilled blood, and uh, later Hyacinth was reborn as a god. Um, that's the same story again. It's Lucifer slaying his former self and then waiting uh, by his own power, since Apollo is still there, to become a god again, father of himself. You'll see the same story repeated uh, a lot in mythology. Uh, it comes to mind Tammuz of the Egyptian Isis, Osiris, Set story, um, story of Attis, story of Adonis, or Adonis, all surrounding a death of someone unjustly killed, but remaining so that uh, in time that they can rise again and be glorified. Their apotheosis becoming godlike or becoming gods from men. Anyhow, the Italian artist's um, version of the death of Hyacinth, he replaced the discus with some tennis rackets. So that's, a, I guess, a, a joke that Kubrick did here. I'm not really sure a lot of people are going to figure that out, but that is the mind of Kubrick. It's interesting to notice the music here that Kubrick picked. Um, it's from a composer, a Russian composer named Stokakovich, and uh, he achieved fame as a composer in the Soviet Union under the patronage of a Soviet chief of staff, Mikhail Trukhanevsky, but later had a complex and very difficult relationship with the Soviet government. He was twice denounced for emulating too much Western compositional influence and had to conform under the oppressive control of the Stalinist regime. Solstakovich was obliged to compose a cantata song of the forests, which praised Stalin as the great gardener. So I'm sure you get the idea here. He was oppressed, he was a genius, he was an artist, and uh, he had to capitulate to his oppressor even calling him the great gardener. So going on, it's interesting to see the uh, background of the paintings in uh, William's house here, William and Alice's house, when they leave their bedroom. Notice the plants, the garden-like pictures. Oh, there's some tomatoes, flowers. There's a nice garden here. A cat. Can't walk. Going now. Wow. Here's a here's a good garden. It has like lettuce, peas, and carrots. Pretty obvious. Helena sure means bright. Now You'll probably notice that Kubrick picks red-haired women to interact with William here. That's because Eve is always depicted with red hair. There's some good examples of this. Michelangelo depicted Eve with red hair after the fall. You can see her hair turns definitely red after the Nakash here that's very woman-like and snake-like. Hands are the apple. There are other 
depictions of Eve having red hair in Renaissance and medieval art. Notice again, here's a, a Hartford depiction. And uh, of course, I got to mention that uh, Kubrick makes sure that there's a lit Christmas tree in every scene, even though the filming of this movie was uh, more than a year long, but he insisted on it. And uh, no one's ever been really able to explain that, but I will attempt to. It all is about the worship of Sibylle and Attis. I'll read something here that explains it the Christmas tree specifically, and it's by a guy named Sir James George Fraser, and uh, he describes it in his book The Golden Bough. Stirred by the wild barbaric music of clashing cymbals, rumbling drums, droning horns, and screaming flutes, the inferior clergy whirled about in the dance with wailing heads and streaming hair, until wrapped into a frenzy of excitement and insensible to pain, they gash, they gash their bodies with potsherds slash them with knives in order to be spat the altar of the sacred tree with their flowing blood. The ghastly rite probably formed part of the mourning for Attis. It may have been intended to strengthen him for resurrection. Further, we may conjecture, though we are not expressly told, that it was on the same day of blood, and for the same purpose the novices sacrificed their virility. Brought up to the highest pitch of religious excitement, they dashed their severed portions of themselves against the image of the cruel goddess. These broken instruments of fertility were afterwards reverently wrapped up and buried in the earth or in subterranean chambers sacred to Sibylle, where, like the offering of blood, they may have been deemed instrumental in recalling Attis to life and hastening the general resurrection of nature, which was then bursting into leaf and blossom in the vernal sunshine. Some confirmation of this conjecture is furnished by the savage story that the mother of Attis conceived by pulling her bosom, a pomegranate sprung from the severed genitals of a man monster named Aegistus, a sort of double Attis. Fraser continues, while the flutes played, the drums beat, and the eunuch priest slashed himself with knives, the religious excitement gradually spread like a wave among the crowd of onlookers, and many a one did that which he little thought to do when he came as a holiday spectator to the festival. For man after man, his veins throbbing with the music, his eyes fascinated by the sight of the stringy blood, flung his garments from him, leaped forth with a shout, and seizing one of the swords which stood ready for the purpose, castrated himself on the spot. He then ran through the city, holding the bloody pieces in his hand, till he threw them into one of the houses which he passed in his mad career. The household thus honored had to furnish him with a suite of female attire and female ornaments, which he wore for the rest of his life. Indeed, the story of Addis, unmanning himself under the pine tree was clearly devised to explain why the priest did the same besides the sacred violet wreath tree at his festival. At all events, we can hardly doubt that the day of blood witnessed the morning practice over an effigy of him which was afterwards buried. The next day in this festival was the Hilaria, the day of joy, when Attis, who was symbolized by the tree, that they brought in the procession earlier rises from the dead. I won't describe that. But uh, what is interesting, though, is the genesis of this worship over time. A lot of people don't have this very well solidified. Here's a timeline of Rome. And the type of worship and the type of worship that they engaged in. First, around 200 BC, they adopted the cult of Sibylle and Attis, but later that fell out of popularity and it was adopted for the cult of Mithra. There's a lot to be said for Mithra being sort of an amalgamation of Sibylle and Attis, or Attis himself, and that went on for a long time. The holiest day of the year, at least for Mithra, also uh, known as Sol Invictus. A part of him was Sol Invictus. If you look at any of the Trachini scenes, the day of his resurrection, which is the 25th of December, the, the, the day that the sun sits still for a while and then rose again. And I think that's the uh, idea 
behind the Christmas tree in uh, Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut. It's symbolizing Lucifer and his weight, his endurance till his resurrection. This ends part one of my continuing series on Eyes Wide Shut. Be sure to visit my website at SiriusTwins.com and click on the Discover Meaning link to learn more about the mythological background that I've been using here. Or click on the link that I will provide at the bottom of this video. Thank you.